International News Now. Okay, so uh, we're going to start our news coverage today with a discussion of the terrorist attack in New York City. And so the first place to start is a, to provide sort of a, a short rundown of what happened. On October 31st, so just a week ago, week ago right, a week ago today, uh, Safulo Saipov, an immigrant from Uzbekistan, used a rented Home Depot truck to kill pedestrians on a bike trail in New York City. It's just a tragic but not uncommon story. This has happened in Europe a lot um, in recent years. He ran his rented uh, vehicle in, onto the bike and pedestrian path and ran down people walking there uh, with, the, with the vehicle. So he, he purposely ran over them. It was, uh, there, there's footage of the immediate aftermath that's pretty um, uh, tragic. Uh, he eventually ran his vehicle into a school bus. I don't think he did that necessarily on purpose. And he got out of the vehicle with what seemed like weapons at the time, but turned out to be something less than that, a paintball gun, uh, which is probably a, the best thing he could find or get, and a pellet gun. Uh, the police uh, then shot him um, as they arrived on the scene, but the assailant survived. Eight people were killed in this attack, and 12 were injured. The subject, uh, the suspect, uh, did not appear uh, prior to this attack on any official terrorist watch list, according to officials that I've seen, at least. I haven't heard any new report that said he somehow uh, was on their radar. And this, uh, then this uh, appears then to be a classic case of a lone wolf attack. The suspect did pledge allegiance to ISIS but as uh, the classic scenario of a lone wolf attack, it's not suspected that he had direct connections with ISIS. He wasn't an operative of ISIS. He wasn't getting direction, resources uh, from ISIS. Uh, instead, he took inspiration uh, from ISIS and, and decided on his own to, to launch these attacks. Now, to give you some context, according to Jane's Terrorism Events Database, which is uh, a well-respected database on uh, terrorist activities around the world, uh, there have been 169 attacks since 2009 by lone wolf terrorists using vehicles as weapons. And so this is, I think, the first one in the United, well, not the first one. I, I'm sure the one at Charlottesville, even though it's a different organization, counted mm -hmm. um, as this kind of vehicular terrorist attack. Uh, it has become a favorite tactic of ISIS, and it is promoted by ISIS in its training videos. This is something that uh, ISIS encourages would-be followers or those inspired by uh, it to undertake around the world. So let's drill down on a couple aspects of this attack, because it highlights some larger issues related to the threat of terrorism in general and some of the concepts we've covered in our module on terrorism. We're going to use several audio clips from the NPR program On Point that spent a whole hour covering this attack and the broader political implications of it. And we're going to start with the central question that motivated this program. Are terrorist attacks, especially small-scale ones committed by lone wolf attacker, attackers who are inspired by a group like ISIS, to use easily access resources like rental vans to attack innocent victims, simply a new fact of life. We're going to play a couple of clips then offer an answer to this question from two terrorist specialists, Bruce Hoffman of Georgetown University and Daniel Benjamin from Dartmouth College. So let's go ahead and roll those two clips now. Can I just start with some of the response we've had from listeners about what happened in, uh, in New York on Tuesday? You know, we put out that we were going to talk about this. We asked the question, do we have to live with this? And right away you get this range of responses. I mean, we have here's uh, one listener who writes in, and the fact that the, an attack like this doesn't happen every single day on American soil says it all about how big a threat terrorism is. It says if you think about it, all the people and all the vehicles out there take very little for someone to snap and plow their vehicle into a crowd. This listener says the threat of terrorism is minuscule. Another here, John, says your chances of being struck by lightning are still greater than your chances of being a victim of terrorism in America. But then Anne writes to us, and Bruce, I'll come to you here. She says, wow. Interesting to see how quickly people have started accepting this. You know, it's minuscule. Don't get, let's not get riled up about it. Wow, let's never accept this. Bruce Hoffman, what do we have to live with here? 
I think we always have to live with the shock and the, the horror that, uh, that these types of attacks generate, because that's exactly the rationale behind them. And yes, the threat is minuscule. Fortunately, terrorism is not a daily occurrence, is not an omnipresent threat. But we understand why these, this type of violence, and especially this very devolved type of lone wolf violence, has become so attractive to terrorist groups, because Firstly, it's so easy to do. Renting a vehicle, driving it through pedestrians is about as low on the terrorism sophistication spectrum as one can imagine. But it does generate enormous fear and anxiety, and it does indeed create the publicity and the attention that the terrorist groups thrive on, and that a, a group like ISIS in particular, who's recently suffered territorial losses and military reversals, is absolutely desperate to prove its continued relevance and being able to elbow itself back into the limelight through a tragedy such as the one that occurred in New York is, is exactly what the motivation for these acts are. Uh, to, a, to a certain extent, I, I fear the answer is yes. Um, if you look at it uh, as a part of a global phenomenon, uh, this brand of terrorism, jihadist terrorism, is going to be with us for quite a while because of the profound upheaval uh, in the Arab world and to some extent the larger Muslim world and, you know, the state systems in collapse, there are shortages of jobs and everything. And um, and when you have a case like ISIS, uh, there are going to be people uh, around the world watching what they're doing, sympathizing with them, very small numbers of people, and an even smaller number will want to act up. And, uh, you know, this has been the story – uh, really, f for quite a while. I mean, just think back th uh, to all the different uh, attempts on soft targets that didn't succeed. You know, we had the uh, just in New York, the Times Square attempt. Uh, Times Square, in many ways, much richer target than than this bike path or the plot against the subways in in New York. Mm -hmm. Terrorism almost always goes after soft targets, and I'm afraid that terrorism um, is a fact of modern life because there's just so many different ways to create destruction and, and a small number of people who seem to always want to do it. Okay, so these clips highlight three key points. First, lone wolf attacks with low sophistication are relatively easy to execute and difficult to prevent. This is because we live in a free and affluent society in which people can move freely and interact freely. This creates almost innumerable soft targets, pedestrians on any sidewalk or bike path, large concerts or sporting events such as the Boston Marathon that was the site of a terrorist attack several years ago, not to mention iconic buildings or areas like Times Square. Moreover, lone wolf terrorists can carry out low-level attacks by themselves with very little planning and coordination with other people or other parts of a group. This provides law enforcement few opportunities to thwart such attacks through surveillance and other types of detective work. There are no terror cells to penetrate, no communications with ISIS to intercept, and little or no funding to uncover. So if you go back to the textbook chapter on terrorism, mm -hmm. th this kind of low-level attack sort of solves the terrorist dilemma, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it has a high, relatively high impact, although the larger the attack, the better from the terrorist perspectives, right? Um, at a very low cost of being detected, right? Because there's such, uh, there's, you don't need networks and groups to, to carry them out. And that's what makes this sort of dangerous mm -hmm. and, and the point of, of these uh, specialists. Now, second, these lone wolf attacks are effective in that they serve the larger political goals of terrorist groups like ISIS. They grab headlines and get the terrorist group the attention they want. Now, this is particularly important for ISIS right now since it has lost so much territory in Syria and Iraq. ISIS is arguably relying on lone wolf attacks like this around the world to keep itself relevant as it reverts away from its more grandiose goal of establishing a caliphate and returns to its roots as an underground insurgent organization. Now, third, while these attacks present democracies with a threat that is extremely difficult to combat, Terrorism remains a very rare event. There's some comfort that can be taken in the fact that there are more deaths caused by factors we tend not to spend a lot of time worrying about, such as lightning strikes or drowning in a bathtub, than 
terrorist strikes in the United States. So why do we focus so much on attacks like the one in New York City or previous attacks on the nightclub in Orlando where many more people die of heart disease, traffic accidents, or homicides? Now we're going to play another clip from Bruce Hoffman's interview on NPR that addresses this question of why we focus so much on the fear and risks posed by terrorism. Secondly, exactly those statistics. I mean, this show is not about people dying from dog bites, for example, mm -hmm. people dying from car crashes. Terrorism, unfortunately, because this is the appeal of its perpetrators, they know that they can thrust their causes and agendas onto everyone's front page or to be the lead story in every um, news item. So it's a proven way of getting attention. And this isn't complaining how the media cover, covers it. It's just, just the reality is that terrorism, unlike other threats to our daily existence or other risks, is something that we expect our and this is the world over. We expect governments to step in and defend their citizens, to stop it, to prevent it, and to make us safe. And it's almost that unrealistic expectation in comparison to having completely risk-free highways that terrorists and their minions seek to exploit because they know they can elbow themselves into the news. So as the clip notes, terrorism by its nature as a conscious and political act of violence attracts our attention and fear. We don't expect the government to really provide us with a completely safe highways or rid us of chronic diseases, but we do expect our government to protect us from organizations that attack citizens in order to achieve their political goals. So finally, let's bring this conversation back to its original question that motivated this discussion. Can the United States do anything about the terrorist threat and the new direction it has taken in the form of small attacks on soft targets? So let's run one more clip from Bruce Hoffman on NPR that gives us an interesting perspective on this. Bruce Hoffman, it's been, we, we talked with you a lot in the, in the days and months and, and years after 9-11. Now here we are, 2017, 16 years later. I mean, overall, how do you think we're doing as, as a nation and for, for New York City in terms of grappling with the, with the threat? I mean, I guess you can call it international and domestic. Fortunately, there's been nothing close to the 9-11 types of attacks, and I think that's a tremendous success story, that we dismantled the international terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, that was behind that. We deprived it of what was then its main operating base. And I think we've had, over the past decade and a half, uh, enormous success in preventing the big attacks. I think, ironically, in retrospect, those may be the easier ones to protect, and I'm not by any stretch of the imagination minimizing the challenge and interdicting and, and preventing those types of attacks. My yeah. only point is those were done by la large organizations. They had a very clear command and control structure. They had minions who money was sent to, who orders were issued, that these persons undertook training. In other words, there were untold numbers of opportunities that they could have been identified and stopped. I think what we're seeing now is really, frankly, a product of our success in that the terrorist groups have adapted and adjusted to even our most successful countermeasures and are relying, just as you've described, on these very low-level attacks against soft, not hardened targets that have this enormous capacity to inflict pain and suffering, not at the level of 9-11, but certainly enough to catapult the terrorists and their organizations and their causes back in the news and enable them to ply their stock and trade of creating fear and anxiety. So Hoffman doesn't really provide an answer as to what to do about small attacks here, but he makes the valid point that's important here about the lack of large-scale attacks like that occurred on 9-11. This is a much larger success for American policy and should not be taken lightly, right? He talks about dismantling Al-Qaeda, defeating ISIS and rolling back its attempt to take, take significant swaths of territory in Syria and Iraq. There have been tremendous gains here for American foreign policy and we often don't hear about these gains from politicians that like to say, to tell their constituents that the other side is failing. The one thing to think about here though is that this success is precarious and that's in part inherent to the nature of the terrorist strike. Because if there was another large scale terrorist oh. strike that happened in the United States where 100, 200 or 300 people were killed in the next three or four years, a politician that has been successful in counter terrorist 
policy and actions over the last 15 or 20 years can't stand up to his or her constituents and say, but look at how, we, how successful we were from 9-11 until 2019 in preventing these things. As soon as, yeah, as soon as one happens, those don't matter and everybody's focused on why did you fail here and what are you going to do in the future? That alters the nature of how terrorism can, alt can influence domestic politics in the United States and the challenges associated with providing security to a democratic society right. in the age of social media. Well, let me just make two points here before moving on, and that is, first, I remember 9-11, and I know you do too, okay. and at the time, the thing, if, if someone would have said, this won't happen again, and you know, you'll get to 2017 and there won't be yeah. anything close to this. And, and I don't wanna make light of <clears throat> what happened in New York City last week or what happened in Orlando. Uh, those are terrible, terrible tragedies, right? In San Bernardino. But the scale, the quantitative magnitude scale makes a difference. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and to think that we have avoided that is something that it doesn't get noted nearly enough. And you can go back to the Bush administration and the Obama administration. What explains that is still sort of in debate, right? Some people will say it's the counterterrorism. Yeah. Some will say, well, it was 9-11 was the fluke. Yeah. Right, And it's going to be really hard to know what explains this because <clears throat> there are so many non-events that the government has, in a sense, prevented terrorist strikes that we won't we won't know because of right. privacy reasons. But one more controversial and secrecy reasons, I should say. <clears throat> what Hoffman's uh, point here about well, we we dismantle Al Qaeda, we rid them of their um, safe havens. Now that goes back to some very controversial actions that were taken in Afghanistan yeah. in that event, invasion. That is not a popular thing, yeah. or Iraq, right, or what we've done against ISIS in Syria and all the intervention there. And so one has to take a new look at that if you yeah. start thinking about, well, this long span of, of no well-orchestrated, organized attack, right? And so that's the one point, is, is that puts a different light on those rather uh, controversial, problematic uh, interventions there. The second <clears throat> is this trade-off between large and small Events. One of the explanations for why there are small events, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> is that they can't pull off big ones. Yeah. The reason they're small ones is because they can't do the big ones and they have adapted mm -hmm. to and settled, if you will, to something much less impactful than um, the, the big attack. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that makes you not want to accept the small ones, but all, but put it in the context, it, it, it's preferable yeah. than regular big ones, or even occasional big ones. Yeah. Yeah. And, if you, and if you want to be ruthless in terms yeah. of assessing this, you can think about this in terms of risk management. Right. right. And if we look back, and this harkens back to what Rob was just talking in terms about the consequences of 9-11 and how significant it is that we haven't had another 9-11 attack. Historians have already started to write about this. 20 years from now, we're going to look back and <clears throat> rec we're already recognizing this now. 9-11 created a major reorientation in the United States and, its Amer and American foreign policy, our, in our institutions, in our politics, and in America's role within the world. A and lot of that reorientation and I mean, in our daily lives. Going to the airport, going through security, everything. A lot of that reorientation hasn't been good. And so if there was a series of waves of attacks, um, we would be talking about much larger long-term consequences. Right. A dystopian kind of, you know, yeah. you, you, eventually you become a security state. Yeah, and, this, and right. this was the conversation in 2001, 2002, and 2003. So I was living in Philadelphia in 2002 and 2003 and, and in New York City a lot. I mean, very different thing when you go into the suburb of New York City and you have a bunch of soldiers with assault rifles holding guard on the subway platforms. When you're living in downtown major cities and you can't sleep at night because helicopters are flying policing operations all right. the way through. This was what was going on in 2001 and 2002 um, when the terrorist threat level was escalated. We don't have this 
in downtown Austin and downtown cities right now. It was a different time back then. Again, broad re reorientation, but there were questions about, we, we talked about this in the terrorism module a little bit. You know, one of the big concerns in the administration in September and October of 2001 is we have to do something before there's another terrorist strike. Right. Because if we have another They're large scale attack and we don't do anything, it's gonna look like we are completely incapable of protecting American society. And there were deep questions, serious questions raised about social stability and confidence in government then. We're a long ways away from that right. now. Um, in part because of the policy successes that the US government has had over the last 15 or 16 years on this. And so it might be that politicians, and we can't talk about this publicly, but they say, we might just have to live with some level because of this deep, larger political conflict um, between the United States and groups that oppose the United States around the world. We might just have to live with this. And if we can, in a sense, move the casualties into low level, low scale relative to 9-11, as a whole, it becomes easier to protect the larger political entity that we're talking about here, which is namely the United States of America. And this is the context at which we need to view things like the diversity visa program, because, you know, we, we had that series of clips to put into context, okay, what can be done about stopping, you know, small scale attacks by lone wolf uh, attackers? And, and kind of the answer has been not much, but there is a different answer, and that's what uh, Donald Trump's and, and the Republican Party in particular's reaction to what they pinpoint as the cause of the New York City attack, and that is the immigration program that allowed this individual to come here in the first place. And so we're going to take this a couple steps at a time. We're going to start with a closer look at the immigration program that's at the center of the controversy in this latest uh, terrorist attack, and that's the diversity visa program. And, and hopefully you'll learn about this program because in, a lot of you quite naturally didn't know what to answer, whether it should end or not, because you probably never heard of it. I hadn't heard about it. Right, I hadn't either. Um, and so the first reason, the first thing to note here is the reason we're talking about this at all, this 27-year-old policy, is that the attacker in New York City uh, was allowed into the country through this program, through the diversity visa program, not last week, not last month, but seven years ago. And that, that time period is important because it raises the question when this person really intended to or was radicalized to carry out this attack. Seven years ago, uh, he got into the country through the diversity visa program, and quite understandably then, because now we have an, an attack that killed people, this program is under assault. And it, it has been controversial already, so that's part of the narrative as well. So what's the diversity visa program? The diversity visa program was sponsored in part, there were other co-sponsors, by Democratic uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, and this plays into the politics of this, in 1990, so this was 20 plus years ago, it was signed into law by President George H.W. Bush, so the first President Bush, Republican, right? Now what does the program do? The program offers 50,000 visas a year to immigrants from countries with relatively low immigration rates over the past five years. And it was initially started and geared toward the Irish. Did you know that? You know probably that. like that, right? You're Irish, I didn't know right? it was about the Irish. It was because there was a shift in immigration toward Latin America mostly, right? And uh, then European immigrants were, were not getting in because there's a, this family based chain migration. And so in order to reintroduce certain groups, especially at the time there was uh, Irish that were escaping economic. Um, uh, this location because there was a crisis there. They said, well, let's develop this diversity program and it'll help Europeans to get back in, into the immigration game. So, so it was introduced with that intent, right? Uh, and it's a pretty small program, actually. Uh, it represents only 5% of the approximately of 1 million green cards, this is the immigration document that allows people to come and live in the United States, that are issued every year. So, so 50,000 seems like a lot, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket 
uh, of all the green cards that are No, Nevertheless, uh, 500,000 immigrants, which seems like a lot of people, have come to the United States through this very program, the diversity visa program, since 2007. So less than, so for over the past 10 years. Most of them have come from Eastern Europe and Africa, since other countries like Mexico, Canada, China, have a lot of immigration to the United States from, uh, through other channels. Now, the key difference, the key thing about this program is that it does not require a sponsor. And the sponsor is usually a relative uh, because we have family-based chain, uh, it's called chain migration, in which family members sponsor um, other family members from their home country to come and join them in the United States. But then there's also employer-based, uh, sorry, merit and usually term merit-based immigration, in which employers can sponsor uh, immigrants as well. But but in both of those instances, there's uh, sponsors that identify and, and help facilitate immigration. Um, in this program, you can come without knowing anyone in the United States and not having you know, anybody in the United States as a tie, right? And that has made it kind of controversial, but it does also expand the scope of immigration, bring in new people, and um, many of them uh, work out really well, right? Uh, the program does require the typical background check that all immigrants go through, and so it's not as though they get less vetted than other immigration programs, they, but they uh, don't get sponsored, right? Now, supporters of the, this, and it's a lottery, and so there's like a million or so people who apply for this, and only 50,000 get it. Right, and so and it, and then how are they chosen? They're chosen by lottery, and so it's just by chance that you get in. Right, so supporters of this program argue that it enhances the country's diversity, and it improves relations with the rest of the world. It's this pl thing where someone can randomly come from Mozambique, make it to the United States, make it big, and and, and then be this ambassador back to these countries. It's it's a, it's a source of hope if you will, for every, all these people who don't have a tie to the United States of getting to uh, the United States. Now, the program has been long criticized by conservatives in particular as potentially susceptible to terrorism threats. So this isn't the first time they've argued this. This, this was argued earlier too. And it has been um, argued that it's susceptible to fraud. There's, there were instances where um, there were 20,000 applications by one person um, trying to hit the lottery, right? Um, uh, there's famous uh, people who have applied, didn't get into the United States through this. One of the 9-11 conspirators tried twice to get a lottery um, visa uh, through this program, but got in another way and then carried out that attack. Now, Finally, the current politics have the Trump administration and Republicans blaming Chuck Schumer and the Democrats for this policy. However, the reality is more complicated. As already noted, the program was signed into law by a Republican president, George H.W. Bush. Moreover, there was an immigration deal much later, in 2013, that had bipartisan support in the Senate that would have ended this diversity visa program but it would have ended it in exchange for legal residency of undocumented immigrants already in the United States. The measure passed the Senate, but then it died in the House due to Republican opposition, not Democrat. Um, although it should be noted that the Republicans weren't opposed to uh, doing away with the diversity program, they were opposed to giving the, le the, the deal, doing the deal on legal status for undocumented immigrants already here. So that's where we're at on, on that. Now, let's uh, now connect these issues by taking a look at President Trump's and other Republicans' calls for ending the diversity visa program and the larger issue of using restrictions on immigration as a measure of counterterrorism. Uh, and we're going to start with a news, a Fox News clip of Republican Mike McCall from Texas, who's also the chairman of the House uh, Committee on Homeland Security. Uh, talk about this program. So let's go ahead and roll that um, clip now. Fox News alert. Of course, terror attack here in New York City yesterday afternoon. Joining us right now is the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, Congressman Mike McCall. Congressman, good morning to you. Morning, Steve. Was this guy on the radar of the feds? 
Uh, to my knowledge, he was not uh, on the radar, and that, that's unfortunate, but uh, we get it right most of the time. This guy was not. Uh -huh. uh, we understand that apparently the New York City Police Department was surveilling, in some measure, uh, the mosque since 2000, 2005. We haven't heard uh, the extent of it. Uh, talk a little bit about the Correct. diversity visa program, which uh, apparently uh, Chuck Schumer attached to the immigration bill back in 1990. And this guy was one of 50,000 people let in from his country of Uzbekistan uh, back uh, a couple of years ago. Well, it's also important to know what Uzbekistan is. A lot of your, uh, you know, listeners may not know what that. They have sent uh, thousands of foreign fighters to fight in Afghanistan and uh, with ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Uh, they have Muslim extremists uh, there. The lottery system, I've always been against it because it's a random uh, system to bring people into the United States. It's not merit-based, completely random. Uh, I've been working with Chairman Goodlight of Judiciary to, to abolish this program and put a, a merit-based system uh, into the United States immigration program. And I think this case just demonstrates why that's absolutely necessary. The president also has uh, tweeted out about how we need a better vetting, extreme vetting. He's right about that, isn't he? He's right about it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Giuliani and Judge Mukasey and I wrote a memo to then candidate Trump calling for higher vetting in high threat areas. Uh, and uh, eventually the travel ban came out of that. But what we meant was, why aren't we, you know, scrutinizing people over there before they can even get into the country with a higher vetting system, putting ICE agents over in consulate and embassy offices? Uh, this uh, case, again, kind of cries out for that uh, legislation, but also that policy. And I think it's high time that we do yeah. this. Well, I think there are a lot of people who now are learning about the diversity visa program. They don't like it. And we'd like to see you guys in Congress do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and it is something we're looking at a package of border security okay. and interior enforcement that we hope to have on the floor of the House by the end of this year. All right. Uh, well, you've got a lot to do. Uh, Chairman, thank you very much for joining us live. Okay. So President Trump and Republicans like Mike McCall are calling for the end of this diversity visa program. However, I, what I want to point out here is the demand uh, actually seems to be going further than simply calling for an end to this particular program. Remember, this is a small program. It's 50,000 uh, visas a year. Uh, President Trump is calling for a broader change, and, and there's, uh, he made a statement right after the attack in, at a cabinet meeting that they got to end this diversity um, uh, visa program, and that was the cause of uh, the attack itself by letting this person in, and then that caused a lot of social media reaction um, geared toward the person he called out, which is Chuck Schumer, and um, faulting him for this attack, basically. And, and, of course, Schumer answered back that, you know, uh, he was, Trump was politicizing this and this tragedy right after it happened, which is, which is um, then that just devolved into a political uh, argument. But what Trump is calling for is a broader change away from what's called chain migration based on family ties to a merit-based immigration system that emphasizes education, job skills, English language uh, proficiency for admission to the United States. And so he's got a broader uh, policy uh, project here. And uh, this would be a much more significant change to the nation's immigration system and arguably achieves some other political goals of the president, such as limiting overall migration uh, and admitting more high-skilled labor uh, that he has talked about. However, it begs the larger question of how this actually comes back to redressing the uh, threat of terrorism. Can these sorts of immigration restrictions safeguard against terrorism? And there are two elements to consider here, and then we'll move on to our next story. First, does a merit-based system necessarily prevent the admission of individuals who might want to do harm to Americans uh, more effectively than a family-based chain migration system. And this goes back to our, our survey here. If, if, if you decide, as many of the people in class did, that, that the real threat is homegrown jihadists, then um, it, you, know, you could do more vetting, but uh, and I guess uh, merit-based might allow for more vetting or in combination with um, 
Trump's overall agenda here allow for uh, or produce more vetting, but it still doesn't necessarily um, prevent the one person or the few people who might carry out these attacks because they won't be able to identify them before they come. That, that's the big question. Can you really pinpoint uh, the guy from Uzbekistan or the person from whatever country they might come from uh, who's going to carry out this attack? Because uh, of the hundreds of thousands of people, he came here seven years ago. There have been hundreds of thousands of people who came through this same program. Not one of them uh, uh, attacked uh, the United the United States in a terrorist attack, and so it's it's an argument. Now the problem, uh, and so it's it goes back to that kind of fundamental uh, question of whether immigration restrictions can be used to safeguard against terrorism in these small scale attacks, and, and that's an open the question. The other thing on family based chain migration is we've got research in terms of what's the profile of terrorists looks like. One of the big predictors is social alienation. Right. right? Well, how do you prevent social alienation? Well, you have family, right? right. Family right. and close exactly. personal friends. And one of the ways that you monitor and, and, and prevent the radicalization once they're here is to have a connection with the communities mm -hmm. that. Um, plant themselves in various locales around the country. Right.